Well, thank you very much for that a very warm introduction, and thank you, uh, Helen, for your uh, invitation to come and uh, share with you something that's very uh, dear to my heart, and that is the psoriasis priority setting partnership. In the course of my uh, talk today, I'm going to be um, also sharing with you a little bit about me by way of introduction, and I'm then going to <coughs> update you on the work of the psoriasis priority uh, setting uh, partnership which was commissioned by the psoriasis association and it's from the work of the psoriasis psp that we've been able to find out the issues that matter most not only to people who have psoriasis their families and friends but also to the healthcare professionals who treat them the psp process has also um, revealed some um, questions to which we already know the answers and so I'm going to talk about those with you and then finally in, in by way of wrap up share with you the next steps in the PSP process so I went to medical school lots of years ago uh, at the University of Manchester and as a medical student mm -hmm. I met a patient who had psoriasis and it was that chance encounter that fostered in me a desire to learn more about skin disease and so in my final year of medical school I requested a placement at the Manchester Skin Hospital which was something that hadn't happened before but fortunately it did happen for me and so it was as a medical student that I met this man here on the left hand side of the screen who I'm sure is known to a great many of you Professor Chris Griffiths even the Daily Mail referred to Chris as the skin care guru so I was in very safe hands in those early days so Chris inspired and encouraged me to follow my dream of becoming a dermatologist you do have to be careful what you wish for because I did my dermatology training in Manchester but I was so curious about psoriasis that I actually in conjunction with Chris but with the help of this very nice gentleman here Professor Paul Brenchley Professor of Renal Immunology at the University of Manchester embarked on a PhD my PhD was funded by the Wellcome Trust and was principally to look at blood vessel changes in the skin in patients with psoriasis. I started my PhD in Manchester and finally in a bid for freedom I managed to go and complete it at Harvard Medical School. Be careful what you wish for. I'm now back in Manchester and my current role is split equally between the hospital and the university. I work as a consultant dermatologists with other colleagues in a clinic dedicated to the care of patients with psoriasis I do my research again with a team of people at the University of Manchester and one of the projects I'm currently involved with and the reason why I'm speaking with you today is the psoriasis association funded psoriasis priority setting partnership I'm also interested in medical education and um, you'll see why that may be a string to my bow later on as we delve into the frequently asked questions but I'm also training program director for dermatology in, in the Northwest which means that I um, guide and uh, direct the training program for our junior dermatologists registrars in training who will one day be consultants so the psoriasis priority setting partnership well priority setting partnerships are exactly that they're partnerships but they're also a process where patients and clinicians work together collaboration is really important and their purpose is to discuss those issues which matter most the idea is that that work will then um, inform and prioritize the future research direction in a specific field moving forward so psoriasis for example 
All of the work is facilitated by the James Lind Alliance. Now, the James Lind Alliance is a non-profit making initiative which was established back in 2004. It brings patients, um, carers and clinicians together and it's kind of a um, United Nations, if you will, of that um, collaborative framework. The work is, the output of a, of a PSP is to try and identify and come up with a top 10 of those most important uncertainties or issues or unanswered questions, uh, often about the effects of treatment, but principally focused on a disease area. James Lind is um, a, a 16th century um, um, naval officer who was accredited really forming doing the first clinical trial and he um, found out that citrus fruits or vitamin C were a good way of treating scurvy and so that's why he and, and the Alliance is named after him. It's really important to understand that the PSP process gives patients a voice. So I'll just give you a moment to read this um, quotation from a patient who was involved in another PSP but why shouldn't all those affected have a chance to jointly discuss frustrations about the things we don't know and our aspirations for the future? It also means that those of us who do research are going to do research that's truly valuable. It's going to make a difference to those patients that I, in my clinical side, care for. Now, all PSPs follow the same standard process, which is a five-stage process. We come together to, to form a partnership. We all establish a steering group to um, guide our future direction and to do the work. And there are usually equal numbers of patients and health professionals on the steering group. We then try and harvest the key issues, usually doing a survey, survey one. We then gather those questions together and divide them into true questions, true uncertainties where there is yet no answer, or unrecognized knowns. So those are things that people are asking. Those are inputs to this first survey where actually we do know the answers. And those are areas where our communication, healthcare professionals to um, people we train, other healthcare professionals, or our communication between healthcare professionals and patients has broken down. There's always a final workshop where the top 10 issues are agreed and decided on, and it's those then that are publicized and taken forward and prioritized for future research. And usually a PSP takes approximately 18 months. So what about a priority setting partnership for psoriasis? Well, this was considered by the Psoriasis Association some time ago. Psoriasis affects over 2 million people in the UK. It has a huge economic cost to the NHS. Access to appropriate care for lots of patients can be very difficult, and there are many unanswered questions. So it was the vision of the uh, Psoriasis Association to set up a psoriasis priority setting partnership to work with patients, families, carers and healthcare professionals to identify those key issues and then to come up with that top 10 list of psoriasis uncertainties. And as a key research funder in the field of psoriasis, the Psoriasis Association were very interested to know what those top 10 issues were so that they could help fund those things that will be of most value. So getting started, well, before um, we even got started, we had to kind of think about how we were going to set up our psoriasis PSP. So it's a very connected, collaborative process. And I think this kind of um, picture depicts it really rather well. So right at the center 
is the, 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 the PSP leading team, and that's based at the University of Manchester. We're funded by the Psoriasis Association. Our work is facilitated by the James Lind Alliance, and we have our Psoriasis PSP James Lind Alliance advisor. We also have d decided strategically to collaborate with the UK DCTN Dermatology Clinical Trials Network based at the University of Nottingham as that group has actually performed another uh, of a great many other skin PSPs. We then reached out to other key organizations to partner with us and then more widely still to the key stakeholders, our patients, carers, and other healthcare professionals. So our partner organizations, those um, big uh, name groups um, who are um, signed up to partnering the psoriasis PSP are on this slide. Um, the BAD, the British Association of Dermatologists, the British Dermatology Nursing Group, the Primary Care Dermatology Society, and somewhat unusually for a PSP in the UK, the International Psoriasis Council. So I'm an international psoriasis counselor, and I felt that it was important to involve the IPC because I felt that what we would find in this country would actually be relevant to other psoriasis sufferers across the world. Also, the IPC are very interested in this process, and they've done another similar Delphi-type project, um, and I felt there was an opportunity to collaborate and share best practice. We then had the extremely challenging task of drawing together our psoriasis PSP steering group. So we wanted this to be a big enough group to cover all of the relevant bases, but actually a small enough group so that we could um, manage ourselves. So we, th th this, is, this is where we ended up. We wanted to have roughly equal numbers of clinicians and patients. We wanted to have, um, a, we draw on a wealth of expertise from all of our steering group members. We wanted to have some males and some females. We wanted to have people who had had different ages. We wanted our patients to have psoriasis, but maybe also to have um, other psoriasis-related conditions. We wanted there to be carers, parents of children who had psoriasis. We wanted representation from black, Asian, minority ethnic groups. And I wanted to have a national perspective. Although Manchester is the lead uh, centre, this is a national project, and I wanted there to be a good national spread of people involved in the work. The other thing is that it's not necessarily the tap on the shoulder you really want um, to be invited to be a steering group member. There's a lot of work involved, and there are some steering group members in the audience, and I'm sure they'll perhaps share with you how much work there really is. So he here we are. We have dermatologists. We have some people from Scotland. We have a general practitioner. We have dermatology nurses, nurses who work in um, tertiary care in major psoriasis centers, and nurses who work in the community setting. We have a psychologist. And we have some experts at the University of Manchester who are, who are leading the project with me. We have our JLA advisor. We have representation from the Psoriasis Association. We have our patient group. And we have some expertise from the University of Nottingham who have done a, a great many other skin and non-skin uh, PSPs before. So our first task was to get going harvesting those key issues through survey one that matter most to patients. And so we launched our um, uh, survey one at the um, British Association of Dermatologists annual meeting in July 2017. And while Helen and Carla weren't looking, I snuck in and took this photograph which shows uh, the boo that resplendent in PSP material. Um, we even have a desk where people can fill in the, um, 
um, for, um, written forms and a post box to post them. But we're very high tech. We've also got, um, as you will probably have seen, an online presence and an online way of submitting our questions to Survey One. And so we collected in all of this material. And this is what came in. We had over 800 people participate, and we received nearly 2,200 individual questions. Now, in terms of size, that's one of the biggest um, responses by a skin PSP. We had many more patients um, than healthcare professionals, but that split is roughly um, representative of other um, PSPs. And then the next thing that we um, tried to do was to sift through all 2,200 individual questions submitted and divide them into those questions where there really was uncertainty. And those questions were actually, we knew the answer, the unrecognized knowns. So remember we had nearly 2,200 total questions coming in and in fact, there is a great amount of um, knowledge out there. We only had 64 knowns received, some from healthcare professionals and quite a lot of uh, knowns received from patients. So broadly speaking, the um, known questions that came in, the frequently asked questions, can be divided into four main themes. And they are the clinical aspects of psoriasis, questions around treatment of psoriasis, questions about access to information or the visibility of psoriasis, and some questions on research. Now, I'm going to um, now go through some of these um, frequently asked questions with you. Um, but I want to issue a warning now at this point because although they're fascinating, Certainly in terms of the, some of the questions that were submitted by healthcare professionals, I think they're horrifying in equal measure. So buckle up and brace for impact. So taking that first theme, clinical aspects of psoriasis, these are actual questions for falling under this theme that we received. So we had questions, what is psoriasis? What different types of psoriasis are there? And does psoriasis cause arthritis? Now, I nearly fell onto the floor in my office when I read this next question, submitted by a healthcare professional. Does it spread by contact? So there's clearly a big training need for our healthcare professionals. But just to answer some of those FAQs, on the clinical aspects of psoriasis. As you know, it's very common. It depends perhaps if you're writing a grant application or not, whether it's two or three or even 4% of the UK population, but it's very common. Um, and something that my um, boss and mentor, Chris Griffiths, often quotes is that on every double-decker bus, there's probably two, three or four people on there with psoriasis, so it's really a visible part of our, of our everyday. Males and females have equal sex incidents, and we were very careful about trying to get, bring that balance into our steering group. And it can come on at any age. It can come on in childhood or in adulthood. There tends to be two peaks of, inc of incidents, one in the 20s and one a little bit later in the 50s. But the majority of cases start before the age of 40. And for some reason, and this is a, an unknown reason, um, females tend to get psoriasis a year or two earlier than males. Now, lots of people with psoriasis have a family history, but not all. So clearly there's something in that hereditary, that genetic um, complement that's really important. I have twins, I have um, dizygotic twins, they're not identical. But even in identical twins, one twin may have psoriasis, but 
oftentimes both twins don't have psoriasis. So there's clearly something else. It's more than just the genes that is causing psoriasis. And so we're aware of a whole host of environmental triggers, things like infection, things like stress, and things like uh, medications and drugs that you can take easily over the counter, non-steroidals, or have, have prescribed um, by your GP. So I actually delved very deeply to prepare this um, presentation, and this is um, a figure from my um, PhD thesis, um, and I borrowed that back in the day from uh, Jonathan Barker in London. And when I looked at it on the train this morning, I wondered really why I'd put it in. It seemed a bit confusing, but really the purpose was to show that, yes, we do know that the environment's important, and we do know that genes are important, but actually, and this, will, this is um, something that's staying in the PSP process, what those genes do is really fascinating, and that is still unknown. So we know that there are some genes, and these may be different for different people, that cause you to be susceptible to psoriasis, but there are other genes, and this is some of the gen genetics work that I did in my PhD, that may well, once you've got psoriasis, change the way it behaves to treatment, change the way it, it behaves to an, a number of um, other stimuli, and maybe confers a difference between mild disease and severe disease. So genes are important, and what role they have is, is, is still uh, needing to be explored. So different types of psoriasis now. So this is cl the classic type. It's chronic plaque psoriasis. It's our most common type. And you'll be aware that it tends to occur classically on the extensor aspects, the backs of the arms and legs. Um, but it can occur on other body sites as well. And one of the really fascinating things about psoriasis is that it's so friendly. All the individual plaques try and join up with all of the other plaques. And when it does that to this extent, um, we, we sometimes just change the name and call it erythrodermic psoriasis. Um, if you look then where you can have that skin uh, affected and, and a normal border, you can then still pick up those classic features. But erythrodermic psoriasis just means that the psoriasis has all joined together and is covering probably about 90% of the body surface area. Uh, guttate psoriasis is actually very rare, and that's the type of psoriasis. Guttate, meaning droplet, very small um, plaques of psoriasis, and classically that's described after a sore throat. SIBO psoriasis is, again, it's just psoriasis, but it's coming in those SIBO or seborrheic areas. So classically the, the eyebrows, the um, nasolabial folds here and around the nose and the mouth, often behind the ears. My taxi driver had that. Um, he was asking me about it as I came from Milton Keynes um, just now. So that's SIBO psoriasis. It's, 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 it's psoriasis, but it, we put the SIBO in because it helps us to understand perhaps what treatments it might respond to. And again, flexural psoriasis, it's still psoriasis, but in a flexural site, uh, in, a, in a skin fold, often there's not as much scaling. And so it's classic psoriasis, really, but without the scale. So redness, the sharp demarcation um, between the affected and the unaffected skin. And then generalized postular psoriasis, and I know that the Psoriasis Association has supported work into this condition recently, um, isn't really a separate type of psoriasis. It's kind of a reaction to, um, or, or a sort of form of psoriasis where the skin is just intensely inflamed and um, some of those um, features of the chronic plaque type are lost because the skin is just studded maybe you can see more easily here, with lots of tiny um, pustules, little yellow-topped um, spots. It's not infected, but it's just covered in these little tiny um, pustules. 
And of course, psoriasis is associated with arthritis. And we think perhaps up to 30% of everybody with um, um, psoriasis does have um, or can develop arthritis. But psoriasis is associated with lots of other conditions, um, particularly what we call immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. So that's where the inflammatory arthritis um, link occurs. But other immune-mediated inflammatory diseases like cardiovascular disease or the metabolic syndrome or uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And psoriasis has more uh, in keeping, has greater similarity to some of these immune-mediated inflammatory diseases than other common skin diseases like eczema, for example. And actually, over the last uh, decade or so, there's been a lot of interest and um, investigation into psoriasis not simply being a skin disease, but actually being a multi-system disease, um, more than just skin. So moving on now to think a little bit about um, questions that come under the, the banner treatment of psoriasis. So again, the healthcare professionals aren't doing desperately well. What are the treatments for psoriasis submitted by a healthcare professional? Um, what new treatments are on the way submitted by a patient? Um, do biosimilar biologicals differ significantly? Um, again, by a, a patient. And a very interesting statement by a patient, um, and I think Carla and, and, and I saw this in our small group work in this particular um, uh, comment, and I think that may have been what um, made Carla think that maybe I could do this talk today, this um, patient-focused A to Z of all psoriasis treatments showing success rates and time taken for effect what a fantastic question, what a fantastic idea. That's definitely something that the PSP needs to have as an output. So here is the psoriasis treatment pathway, and it's kind of like a, a series of stairs where um, you move up from one step to the next. Um, typically, doctors sort of um, think that patients fail at one step or don't do as well as they should at one step before they move on. And with each step, there's perhaps greater chance of treatment success, but also the trade-off is that there may be greater chance of side effects of treatment. So at the bottom step, there's the topical treatments, then there are light treatments, then there are sort of tablet-based treatments, and then biologic treatments. And over the last two years, it's an exciting time to be a healthcare professional with an interest in psoriasis. Over the last two years alone, we've had new topical treatment, we've had new tablet treatment, and we've had a reiteration of um, an off-license treatment that now has a drug license. Um, this is fumaric acid um, esters. We used to use it as fumiderm, which now that it's licensed, potentially opens up access to very good treatments. But over the last 15 years ago, much of our um, uh, practice has been just transformed and m the expectations from our patients for clear skin has become a real reality as we've had the opportunity to use biological treatments. So the really interesting thing about biological treatments is that they are incredibly hard to make and they are in fact products that are made from um, living creatures, living organisms and that's completely different to regular drug production where it's literally just a sort of a, a chemistry experiment in um, a, a safe uh, environment um, rather than this living um, organic um, culture system that's required. So this means that biological therapies are by their very nature difficult to produce, they're very expensive. They've also um, taught us a great deal about what causes psoriasis, those pathways that are really important in the development um, of psoriasis. And our earliest um, uh, encounter with them was back in 2004 and there's been a fairly constant stream of different products 
um, available. Since 2015, we've had three new products and we're literally on the threshold of uh, the most amazing explosion in treatment options coming very soon, probably later this year, is a brand new um, biologic, an IL-23 product, a whole new different um, type of biologic, and a, a psoriasis license for um, a product that's already um, been used very successfully in psoriatic arthritis. And in the coming years, there will be many, many more new treatments. The other thing that's just arriving with us at the moment are biosimilars. Um, and biosimilars are um, the generic version of branded biologics. If I just go back two slides, these older treatments are now um, losing their patent protection. And so there's now opportunity for other companies to copy those molecules. Although we hope that this will then make um, uh, treatment more affordable and offer greater access to treatment, it's actually really hard to copy a biologic because of how they're made. Um, because they involve the, the output of a living system, living organisms, we can only say that, biolog that, that biosimilars are highly similar. So it's not quite the same as going to Tesco's and buying your paracetamol or going to Sainsbury's and buying some more paracetamol where they are identical a biosimilar biologic is highly similar, so it's a different treatment that's very, very similar to the parent or the originator. So that's why there's the picture here with the dark um, orange and the light orange. They're, they're, they're very similar, as similar as we feel will make no difference, but they are not the exact same. So moving now to think a little bit about access to information and visibility of psoriasis. So a question um, from a, a patient on where is the best place to go to get information about um, psoriasis? And then this time I thought the healthcare professionals had actually made quite a sensible um, question. What are the best online advice sites to recommend to patients? So, Actually, that was quite um, an interesting question to try and answer for today's um, talk. Um, and maybe this is where we need to have a, a dialogue and perhaps um, you can share um, um, your, your advice on this. And then um, a very interesting comment. Um, for the first time in a long time, the psoriasis magazine had someone on the um, cover displaying the condition for such a common condition, we don't see it enough. So in terms of where I refer um, patients um, for um, information, I um, have two main sources, Psoriasis Association and the British Association of Dermatologists patient information leaflets uh, section. And we have this really open in clinic all the time to print um, things off and, and give them um, out. Um, but it'd be interesting to know what you would recommend or what sites that you have um, found to be most um, helpful. So I wanted to maybe touch a little bit about the visibility of psoriasis and for certain, and there are people in the room who can, who can say that this really did happen. I've spent a lot of my professional life doing this to patients, covering them in tar-based bandages. But actually, patients often feel that they have to do that themselves and they have to hide away. Um, and it can be very difficult to display psoriasis skin. Um, and it can be a very brave um, person who um, does that. And I think it is important to really um, take a lead from Psoriasis Association and show um, our skin disease so that we can actually help change hearts and minds. And this is a comment that I read um, with interest from the, the PSP. Um, and I think actually that covering over um, 
can actually stop people accessing information and really um, there's a call to make information just as easily available as it can be. Obviously there are websites that are very useful but actually um, making our information accessible makes it visible and perhaps also helps with that um, conversation with the general public. So lastly, to look at um, research. So research obviously is something that's very um, close to my, um, my heart. And um, I thought these would be very easy to answer. And in fact, actually, they're not. So is there any research being done? How do I get involved? And why are many people not used to experiment psoriasis treatments? And then from a healthcare professional, can there be a registry uh, for children too? So let's have a little look at some of those. So I would um, make a plea, and um, again, the Psoriasis Association um, is already there with um, signposting how to get involved um, with uh, research. I think it really is important um, to um, take part. As a first step, if you're a research uh, e novice, take part in the in the PSP. Your views are really important and that can help make a difference. The Psoriasis Association, as you know, is a funding body. It funds research. Um, so they have a call for help for, for people to help review uh, research grant applications. Um, but also um, I had a they also publicise research in the So um, magazine. And I had a patient of mine in Manchester pitch up with her So magazine and show me that the Psoriasis Association were funding a project on postular psoriasis in London and she wanted to be involved and how could I help her? Well, the dermatology world is a small place and I actually know the London group very well and so I was able to do help her take part we took all her samples in Manchester and we sent them. We regularly actually send samples down to London. And that she felt really great about being able to be involved. I think it's really important, though, to stay within your comfort zone. You don't have to um, give huge pieces of skin or, or blood samples. Please do so if you want to. But um, perhaps just take part in a focus group. Share your experience. And it's really important for psoriasis sufferers, if they can, to help. Because the only people, the only um, animal that gets psoriasis is the human being. So actually, any work that you read about uh, animal models or mouse models of psoriasis, they're not actually psoriasis at all. This is a mouse model that I'm very interested in because it recapitulates what's happening from a vascular perspective in the skin of a patient with psoriasis. But the most I can say is that it is psoriasis-like. It, it is remarkably psoriasis-like. It looks a bit like it uh, to the naked eye. It looks a bit like it under the microscope. When you do some special stains and look at those uh, important proteins, Yes, it um, looks very like um, psoriasis immunologically as well. Um, it even behaves a bit like psoriasis. It cobnerizes, but it isn't psoriasis. So it's really important, if you can, to please take part. Now, I don't want to steal Kathy McAlone's thunder, and I know she's going to talk about the biologics uh, registry a little bit later, but again, taking part in research, you can just really um, do that very easily by allowing your clinician to enrol you uh, onto the BADBE, the British Association of Dermatologists Biologic Interventions Register. That is, in fact, a research study. It's a prospective observational cohort study, and it's been um, producing some val very valuable outputs um, as it was established around about 2007. So the idea of the registry is to follow individuals on treatment, on tablet treatment and on biological treatment, in order to tease out those long-term um, benefits and those long-term um, adverse events or side effects 
to treatment. A clinical trial doesn't give all the information that we really need. The clinical trial um, situation is analogous to this fruit bowl here on the right-hand side. It's a short um, view um, of a complex situation, and it's very highly organized and separated out. What the registry attempts to do is look for a long, long time at the real world setting where all the fruit is in the fruit bowl with the cream on top and the spoon constantly churning around those contents. So that's really vital information. So that's another good way of taking part in research. The um, registry was established in 2007, so it's just over a decade old, which means that um, now we're in the vanguard of a number of really important um, outputs from that work, um, and that's really guiding some of our very complex choices for drug treatments and our um, conversations with patients. So I just wanted to sort of wrap up, really, with thinking a little bit about um, next steps. So clearly, one of the most important next steps from this part of the um, PSP is um, communication and education and training. But in terms of the PSP itself, what we're now um, looking to do is uh, wade through over just about 2,100 um, unknowns. We're checking all of those very thoroughly with the literature to make sure that we're not um, um, putting forward into the next part of the PSP any items where there is a, a good research basis already established. And we're looking to um, put into uh, Survey 2 um, all of these unknowns. And the way we've tried to do that is to look at them as a steering group very carefully and th um, theme them so that we can um, draw together the main... Um, uh, um, sort of question themes and we think we're going to be able to have round about 45 questions in our survey too and we want you to cast your vote we believe survey two will be um, up and running in about two three weeks time so very very soon we do just have a little bit more tidying up to do um, on that but um, your vote your participation is really key. And you can do that by paper, but you can also do that um, online um, through the website to our PSP page on the Psoriasis Association website. And um, I made this QR code. I'm the least tech savvy person on the planet. Um, but Nick Lavelle, president of the BAD, he to told me how to do it. I press my children no end if you have the QR code app and you scan this QR code you will zip straight to the psoriasis PSP web page and then you can cast your vote so use this QR code once we've had you vote so when you when you go to our um, uh, to our sort of voting page you're going to be presented with those 45 um, st or so stems or, or questions and you get to kind of ch pick the 10 things that really matter most to you what we're going to do back in Manchester is then tally up who's voted for what and we're going to then organize those 45 into the kind of um, a bit like a general election really into the kind of top uh, ranked um, um, uh, questions and we're going to then take about 20 25 of those questions into um, what's called a final workshop and we're hosting our um, psoriasis PSP final workshop um, at BAD House, Willen House, in Fitzroy Square, London, on the 17th of um, September. And this is what happens at a PSP final workshop. Here are all 20 questions, and here are PSP workshop participants, the steering group, um, and, and other um, uh, 
people to um, thinking very carefully and discussing and sharing how we can um, order those so that we end up with a top 10 um, of key issues that need to be urgently researched. Now, there's been many strategic things in the PSP, and this date is a, a strategic um, pick as well, because that's the first day of the psoriasis shout-out week that for the last um, several years the team in Manchester have done. Now, the PSP is separate from the psoriasis shout-out, but I really felt it was important to piggyback on something that really already has a very good footprint and would be a really nice way to kickstart um, the, the, the week of events which involve clinicians and researchers engaging with um, patients and the public. So um, it's on the Monday of the psoriasis shout out week. And then finally, we will have at the, at the end off uh, that day, Monday 17th of September, we will have our top 10 list of uncertainties. And it's these things that are going to make a difference. Um, and I will then need to work um, with colleagues to promote those so that key people know, patients, carers know, research funders know um, and the wider research and policy community know. I'll, I'll have to do a little bit of work behind, behind that to kind of um, make those visible. So just to summarize, for very many years, academic researchers and commercial entities have really held key and pivotal roles in setting the research agenda and patient views have been um, given much less emphasis. Your psoriasis PSP will identify really important questions that need to be answered and will give psoriasis patients a voice. Our top 10 list of key priorities will promote work that's really highly relevant and highly valuable and will answer the, those most important questions. So if there's one thing to take home from today's talk, it's please vote in Survey 2. And just in case you missed it, here is, again, the um, website address, the lovely QR code. Tell other people about it. Um, share on Twitter or any social media platforms you have. And I'd just like to thank um, the funding we've had for this work from uh, the Psoriasis Association to st say that all of our uh, work in the PSP is facilitated by the James Lind Alliance. We're very grateful for collaboration with University of Nottingham and the UK DCTN uh, team the very hard work of the psoriasis um, PSP steering group, acknowledge the contribution of our psoriasis PSP partners and those who have already participated in the PSP process. I'd like to thank you for listening and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have. <laughs>